being here this morning to learn about the impacts of climate change on business. So I'm personally so excited to learn from all of you. And um, we just have a fantastic panel today. So I'm Danny Glazer, for those who don't know me. I'm one of the founders and co-directors of Westchester Green Business, along with my partner, Scott Fernquist. And you'll hear from Scott in a little bit. So are you doing slides or am I I'm doing them? <laughs> so Westchester Green Business is a partnership of, it's a program of the Business Council of Westchester in partnership with Westchester County Government and my company, Green Team Spirit. This is our ninth year that we have been an organization, so we're very excited about that. And um, we are very happy to have Deputy County Executive Kevin Plunkett here today and Marsha Gordon, President and CEO of the Business Council, who are also going to welcome you here so the, as our partners. Okay. And we have been holding this Leaders in Sustainability Speaker Series here at the Gateway Center for a few years now. I can't remember when we started. And, um, and what better place than this LEED Gold building. And we're just very, very grateful to the college for hosting us um, every year, four times a year. So we, we just love our sponsors. We could not do this work without our sponsors. Um, we have three platinum sponsors, um, Con Edison, NYSERDA, and Westchester Community Foundation. We have Jane Solnick here and a lot of Con Edison people here today, um, a founding sponsor. And we also have Laura Rossi and Tara Seeley from Westchester Community Foundation here with us today and, um, and represented from Regeneron. So, but I'm excited to say now that all of our, of our bronze sponsors are certified. So we have, yay, you know, so, um, as is Agara and Regeneron. So 10 companies of, who are sponsoring our program are certified. Um, so it really, I think, speaks volumes for how they believe in the program and want to support us financially. So what is Westchester Green Business? Um, so the program is designed to provide a collaborative group of Westchester County organizations from diverse industry sectors with step-by-step -step training and tools they need to successfully integrate environmentally sustainable practices into their operations. So they complete surveys, they implement sustainable practices, measure their greenhouse gas emissions, and focus on the areas of organizational commitment, energy, waste and recycling, um, green purchasing, transportation, land use, and water. So aside from helping companies become certified, we hold events like this, educational events throughout the year for the general business public. So it's not just that we're focusing on our 86 companies that are going towards certification, where we really here are here as a resource to all businesses, not only Westchester, but now in New York State. <clears throat> so this is just a little collage of things that are going on with our program. So we have our um, annual, the WGP, the Blue Award, we have an annual recognition event and award ceremony where we honor our companies who have achieved certification and done so many things to uh, be sustainable. And this is a great shot on the right upper corner of our interns. We, our internship program is fantastic. We're matching college um, students and graduate students in the Westchester and surrounding area with our company. So they're going through an intensive two-day training and then they get matched into our companies and they go in and they have been very successfully helping our companies to become certified. So we are very proud of that program. And then these um, two on the bottom are from our certification ce ceremonies. We had one last night for Bright Energy Services. Because the interns are working so fast and furiously, we've been having a lot of certification ceremonies lately. We see Kevin and you know, Marsha on a regular you know, basis, but it's, it's just fantastic. So these are the companies that have achieved certification. So we have 86 companies, 25 companies of the 86 are certified. So, and they've worked very hard to do that. And the other companies are also on the path and working toward it. So we're gonna take a moment. So this is slide one of our companies and the ones that are highlighted are certified. So we're very proud, as I said, very diverse from hospitals to ice cream stores and everything in between. 
And now I'd like to introduce my partner, Scott Fernquist, who is going to... Okay, I'm sorry, I got messed up by the slide. Kevin, would you like to join us? So good morning to everyone. Um, my name is Kevin Plunkett. I am the Deputy County Executive for our County Executive Rob Astorino. And, and as county government, we are very proud to be a partner with the Westchester Business Council. Marsha Gordon is here today, John Ravitz, and a partner with uh, Danny and Scott uh, in, in the Westchester Green Business Program. It is really uh, a very important part of, of what we do in government and to have a series like the Leaders in Sustainability series, which we're here today to listen to, uh, so we all learn, uh, is so important, not just for the current time, but for the future. We're all here to, to make sure that the next generation uh, has a, a better and greener place to live, a more sustainable place to live. Uh, I'm very proud to work every day with our Director of Energy and Sustainability, Tim Carey, who is here. Tim uh, has a great background in um, energy and sustainability, working with the state government and many different uh, levels. So, Tim, thank you for what you do every day. And I'm very proud to have served on the Sea Level Rising Task Force. Uh, before I had the position in government, I was the chairman of the Greenway Conservancy for the Hudson River Valley, thanks to Governor Pataki. And that gave me an opportunity to, to, to serve on a task force uh, which directed itself solely to climate change and its impacts. So I know the importance of today's panel discussion uh, for uh, all of us here and for the resources that we have in our county. Uh, the county has undertaken a, a vulnerability study so that we can make sure our assets uh, are protected, not only currently, but for the future. And it's because of, of those studies and, and, and the climate change concerns uh, that we are all working hard to make sure that our assets are protected. So, this type of a leader in sustainability series and this type of a topic is so timely and I want to thank our partners for putting it on. I want to thank all of you for being a part of the present, but certainly a big part of what's going to happen in the future. So on behalf of County Executive Rob Astorino, on behalf of myself, thank you for your efforts. We're there if we can be of help. This program, the Westchester Green Business Program, is one of the most successful and important programs that we have here in Westchester County when it comes to environmental sustainability. So please keep up the good work. Thank you. <laughs> Marsha Gordon, uh, a great partner from the Westchester Business Council. Marsha. Yeah. You. you know, I can say um, what what Kevin um, modestly doesn't say is that it is really because of the partnership of our county executive that this program has grown. Um, we would not be able to do it without his leadership, um, certainly Kevin's leadership and Rob Astorino's leadership to make this, um, to, to make this happen. So thank you, uh, thank, thank you so much again. Um, I'm here and the reason that the Business Council of Westchester has really, um, is so proud of having this program as part of our business and economic development initiatives is because sustainability and green business is an economic development issue. One, we want to be a healthy county. And in order to be a healthy county, we have to be a county that cares about our environment, that cares about sustainability, and that cares about green business practices. But even more important and more practical, maybe not more important, but more practical, we know that economic development is all about talent. Look at the Amazon, look at the Amazon um, bid. It's all about, they want to go in a place where there's great talent and great, even more important than tax incentives and land and all that, it's the talent. And in Westchester County, we have that talent. And one of the reasons that we do, we know is because businesses like yours are businesses that people, and young people in particular, want, want to work for. They are attracted to work for companies that have corporate social responsibilities and that, have, and that, and that, care, and that care, care about their communities. And that, 
that goes far and wide. So being a green business, being a great business that lets people volunteer, being a business that cares about sustainability and good working conditions, they all go together. And that's what we are building here, and that's what you're about. So I want to thank you. On behalf of the business community, I want to thank our panelists today. I know you're here to you, you're you're here to to hear them and not us, but I really wanted to acknowledge their leadership and their knowledge they're going to share, which I'm unfortunately going to miss because oh poor me, I'm on my way up to a meeting in Marlboro, New York, at a winery. So, how bye everybody. So how lucky we are to live in the Hudson Valley, right? Okay, enjoy. <laughs> I'd like to welcome up uh, Jean Maloney. Is Jean Maloney here from WCC? Hi. Okay. She is the uh, Assistant Dean of Workforce Development and Community Education here at Westchester Community College just to welcome us this morning. Thank you. I'm the shortest speaker here. So. Um, on behalf of our president, Belinda Miles, I just want to welcome you all here to campus on what a phenomenal morning it is. Um, if you have two seconds to begin your weekend a little early, take a walk around campus and feel the energy that happens around here each day. Um, not as many students here on a Friday that allows us to have events like this, which we're happy about, but um, well, you're most welcome to take a walk around. So I want to thank Yaradania Camacho, a member of our team that works with all of you to have these um, seri this series here at the college. And I want to thank each of you for all that you do to contribute to the well-being of all of us that live and work in the county. Thank you and have a great meeting. So as Marcia said, said uh, you're not here to hear us, but to hear the panelists. I'm not going to take too long, but I'm, I'm actually very excited to introduce our topic today, which is, as Danny pointed out, how business adapts to the impacts of climate change and how, it imp how climate change overall impacts the business community. So let me get to my slide, which is a little bit cryptic, but I'm going to explain it. So last fall, around this time of the year, first-year MBA students at Harvard Business School were actually asked um, they received an assignment with the exact same topic as the one this morning, how climate change affects business. So students were, introduced to were instructed to choose a company or a nonprofit organization whose operating mo model is likely to be significantly affected by climate change, including threats and opportunities associated with mitigation or adaptation. So they were asked to describe how the organization is likely to be affected, the steps the organization is taking to address those effects, and describe and justify what additional steps um, they think are necessary for the organization to be successful. So what we're looking at here is actually a word cloud which shows 800 blog posts that resulted from this project. And so you can see some of the words that come out like energy, interesting, solar, impact, and that sort of thing. So 929 students in the end took the climate change challenge and they analyzed organizations which included Toyota, General Mills, Maker's Mark, Amazon, which we just mentioned, um, and Vail Ski Resort. So their responses can actually be found on a really great website, which I recommend you check out, called Open Knowledge. And it's a public blog that Harvard Business students created to discuss the issues that we're talking about this morning. And it's also meant to share ideas with the rest of the world, including us here in Westchester. So I love this story uh, and the assignment and how today's business students and really the next generation of business leaders are actively collaborating around solutions to help businesses adapt to the real and profound impacts of climate change. So our topic today here has really never been more relevant and we started actually planning this event well before um, the recent storms and hurricanes that have really wreaked havoc on so many lives and businesses um, close to us. So as you know in, in 2017 it was actually the most active month on record for Atlanta hurricanes, which had a significant impact on the business community. So we don't know exactly what the future is going to bring, but it's clear that we all need to work together on developing solutions to mitigate the risks that climate change presents to the business community and to the community at large. So there's really no better way to do this, in my opinion, um, than to have events like the one today um, and to share information, learn from each other, um, and that's really what our program, Westchester Green Business, strives to do. So I'm going to introduce our first speaker um, and bring up her presentation here. Sure. 
Okay, Anjali Sauthoff. So she is, Anjali is an environmental health scientist who is interested in the translation of scientific research into policy and practice. She works with universities, government, industry, and the nonprofit sector to, to develop integrated approaches to addressing societal impacts of sea level rise and, cha and changes in climate, as well as health effects of environmental exposures. Currently, she is working with Westchester County to analyze the effect of future sea level rise on county assets, which Kevin Plunkett referred to. Previous research at the Energy Institute at the University of Wisconsin at Madison focused on mitigation strategies for reducing transportation-related climate emissions. She received her PhD in environmental health sciences from Columbia University and her master's degree in neurobiology from SUNY Stony Brook. So, Anjali, welcome. Oh yes, we have a shorter person here. <laughs> okay, so for the past year and a half or so, I've been working with Westchester, Westchester County um, as a consultant to analyze, again, the impacts of sea level rise on county assets. And today I'll give you a brief overview of the potential impacts of sea level rise on Westchester County businesses. So I'd like to start by, can you hear me okay? By focusing on risk. Um, risk, generally speaking, is exposure to danger, harm, or loss. And in the business context, it's typically broken down into internal and external risks. Um, internal risks are usually easier to control and involve um, talent, technological innovation, physical, um, so machinery, and operational factors. Whereas external risks are harder to control and involve, are focused on economic and political factors, regulation, compliance, and natural disasters, um, earthquake, floods, and sea level rise. This is where our focus is gonna be today. So Westchester County um, sits between the Hudson River um, to its west and Long Island Sound to the southeast and has 77 miles of shoreline, making it vulnerable to sea level rise as well as the storm surges and flooding that, um, exas that are exacerbated by sea level rise. Its coastal communities are a rich source of history, culture, recreation. Approximately 20 municipalities sit along the shore of Westchester County, and much of the infrastructure that is contained in these municipalities was constructed before the consequences of sea level rise were recognized. Historically, um, in New York, Sea level has risen 15 inches in the past 150 years. So these are actual measurements taken from tidal gauges in Battery, off the coast of Battery Park in New York Harbor. And we can, see, we can see this rise over the last 150 years. Sea level in our region has been rising primarily because of thermal expansion. So as water gets warmer, it takes up more space. Um, the melting of ice sheets, land subsidence. So in the New York area, land has been sinking at a rate of three to four inches per century. And local atmospheric and, um, atmospheric and ocean dynamics can also cause changes in sea level rise. You mentioned the New York State Sea Level Rise Task Force. So in 2011, the New York State Sea Level Rise Task Force concluded that inundation of low-lying areas, increased erosion of beaches and bluffs, saltwater infiltration, possible compromise of low-lying infrastructure, and increased frequency and intensity of severe flooding and storm surge damage are consequences, likely consequences of sea level rise, future sea level rise. 
And here in New York, what is, whoops, I'm sorry, what is currently a one in 200 year storm in the next 50 years is predicted to become a one in 75 year storm. So what is at the extremes currently will become the new normal. So just in February of this year, the DEC adopted official science-based sea level rise projections as part of the Community Risk and Resilience Act. And what they've done is divide New York, the New York region into three uh, geographic areas. For each of these geographic areas, we'll, we'll um, experience slightly different um, projections of sea level rise. Um, for each region, they've divided um, into, t into four, they've made projections for four different time periods, three decades in the year 2100. For each time period, there are five different projections, low, low, medium, medium, high, medium, and high. And the way that it's to be interpreted, for example, in the decade of 2050, um, eight inches of sea level rise is very likely to be exceeded in, in that decade. 11 inches is likely to be exceeded. 16 inches is just as likely as not to be exceeded. 21 inches likely, uh, sorry, unlikely to be exceeded, and 30 inches is very unlikely to be exceeded. So the range spans, the range of their projection spans from two inches to, to over six feet at the end of the century. So how could sea level rise affect Westchester County businesses is the question. There are approximately 43,800 businesses in Westchester County. Um, this data was compiled by InfoGroup um, for the Office of Economic Development in conjunction with Westchester County GIS. And of those businesses, how many, approximately 90, 80 to 90? 80, okay are part of the Westchester County Green Business Group. And these, these businesses span across, whoops, sorry, again, many sectors um, from agriculture, mining, infrastructure, um, and many of these sectors are predicted to be impacted potentially by sea level rise. This is just to give you um, a better idea of a, of a finer scale. Um, this is Larchmont. The green are Westchester County businesses, red, again, Westchester County green businesses. And just to orient you, here's Hampshire Country Club, um, Hammocks Middle School, Mamaroneck High School, Shore Acres, Harbor Island Park. So this is with today's um, sea levels. This is today, this is uh, Larchmont with one foot of sea level rise, three feet, and six feet, where you can see that, um, so Harbor Island Park is completely inundated. Uh, here, where is Hampshire? Here's Hampshire Country Club. <coughs> and these are current floodplains. So this, this just gives an idea of potential flooding. It's a little bit misleading to only look at sea level rise because as sea level rises, what happens is the floodplain extends further inland, creating the potential for more extensive damage. This is an aerial photo under this blob of Playland Park in Rye with six feet of predicted sea level rise, which seems to, which again, if you remember that big table, it's far, in, it feels far into the future, right? Um, these are, this is a NOAA sea level rise model that is overlaid onto um, Playland to show you, to give a, an idea, a snapshot of potential extent of flooding. But this is, these are actual pictures taken with 2012 sea levels from the, the eight-foot eight storm surge that came with Superstorm Sandy. So you can see that the water lines are almost identical. You don't have to go that far into the future to experience damage. 
Just a few years ago, a comprehensive assessment was undertaken. It was commissioned by Bloomberg and Hank Paulson to look at the economic risks of climate change in the United States. And the, the most significant economic impacts were predicted to be large-scale loss of coastal property and infrastructure, extreme heat across the nation threatening productivity, human health, and energy systems. So the number of days above 95 degrees is predicted to significantly increase, impacting energy systems and, and having downstream effects on human health. Um, as well as shifting agricultural patterns, which I think will be addressed um, in a few minutes. And with Superstorm Sandy, Cuomo um, estimated $42 billion worth of damage and repair costs. Um, of that, $400 million uh, impacted businesses in Westchester County alone. I think something like 200 and 65,000 businesses were affected in, in New York State. So we move from risk to resilience. Resilience will mean different things for different businesses. Um, I had to put this quote up from Olympia Snow because I'm from Maine. If we were told that we had at least a 90% chance of averting a disaster, <coughs> excuse me, through changes we ourselves could make, wouldn't we take action? So this action and building resilience will begin by understanding risks that businesses face and evaluating everyday business practices in the context of that risk. Then it can be determined whether investments in property or long-term infrastructure are necessary. It'll be important to examine supply chains um, in light of anticipated changes and which products or services would be more or less valuable considering the future. Geographic scope will be uh, important, that's self-explanatory. Um, and partnerships, whether they're public-private partnerships or within between sector partnerships in order to address, in order to, to uh, develop resilience at a regional scale um, I think that there will have to be partnerships in order to, to address the common concerns. So again, resiliency will mean different things for different organizations. Um, we, are in the con we are in the process of developing strategies to address risks and resilience um, among businesses among, at the county level. So I would encourage you to, to reach out and um, you know, we can, we can help in any way that we can help support. We would love to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're actually going to save your questions for the end when um, all four of the presenters are done and, and we'll, you know, there'll be plenty of time for Q&A. So thank you. I got a sneak peek of Anjali's slides before um, today and I was telling her, the slides about Larchmont were, you know, hit really close to home for me because the house I used to visit, my grandmother's home in Larchmont growing up, is very close to being flooded in a few years. So that, I thought that was really, you know, it becomes very real when you see maps like that. So thank you for, thank you for putting those slides together. So I'm very pleased to welcome our next presenter. His name is Mark Drexel, who's the department manager for the project management office um, electric operations at Con Edison. Mark joined Con Edison in 1983 as a technical engineer at Indian Point Nuclear Station. He held numerous positions of increasing responsibility, including fire safety and security manager, site protection manager, site services department manager, emergency management, central support operations. In 2014, Mark was tasked with creating the Distributed Resource Integration Project Management Office in support of the company's Reforming the Energy Vision initiatives or REV. He is currently heading up the creation of a project management office for the Electric Operations Organization. Mark has been the project lead for numerous projects, including Public Service Commission, Audit of the Emergency Response Program, System Emergency Assignment Project, Deep Thunder Project, IP Circulating Water Pump Replacement Project, and I could go on. So Mark holds a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from Manhattan College and a master's degree in organizational behavior from Mercy College. 
He holds a professional engine engineer's license and is a certified project management professional. So welcome, Mark. Good morning, everybody. So I have an interesting uh, topic to discuss, and that is our efforts after Sandy, which was five years ago. Um, it, I'm sorry? We need you. Oh, sorry. I like to move, but. You can take it off. No, it's OK. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll manage. Okay. I'll manage. So after, uh, after Sandy uh, um, struck, it was, it was obvious that we needed to take some action to um, mitigate any future Sandy and also take into consideration climate change and what could happen in the, in the future. So I'm going to talk about uh, the impact. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, our objectives and, and, and our philosophies behind uh, how we attacked our improvements, um, show you a little bit about our, our um, storm uh, hardening work that we actually uh, completed um, after a four-year program, a uh, billion dollars worth of uh, ratepayer money. Uh, we were uh, very successful in, in completing a project on time, on budget, and within scope. Um, and then we'll give a little summary of it going forward. So October 29th, uh, five years ago, we all know the statistics behind it. Uh, the point that I wanted to make here is that the, at Battery Park, uh, was a little over 14 feet of, um, of uh, storm tide. And really, you know, if, if we had 14 feet of protection and it was 14.06 feet, it would be like we didn't have any protection at all. Because if you think about all the water would come over anyway and fill. So, so that, that is critical to what you design to. And, and we'll get on to some of the, the details behind that going forward. Um, so it was a significant impact. Um, electric customers, steam, and gas customers were all affected significantly. Um, we lost a, uh, a significant amount of, of infrastructure. Um, we're right on the water. We built near the water. Uh, it was very convenient for power stations uh, because we need cooling water for those power stations. That's why they're near the water. So uh, as you can see, this is a dramatic picture of lower Manhattan, uh, which got inundated with water. And a um, significant part of the, of the area was blacked out as a result of uh, submerged equipment for the most part. I'm going to focus on electric uh, because most of what uh, was damaged was underground and it was the electric system. But I wanted to make sure everybody understood that it was the steam and gas were also affected by, uh, by the superstorm. Dramatic picture. You know how long this equipment, its electrical equipment, was under salt water? Maybe 12 hours. And this is what happened to it. Um, as, soon as, as soon as the water subsided, the corrosion started, and within hours, you could start to see this. So brackish water is a very uh, dangerous thing to electricity. Uh, most of what we did, we did shut down our electric. It would have been even worse if we had shorts as a result of the salt water. Uh, so we, were, we saved a lot of equipment, but we couldn't save um, all of it going forward. We will. So <clears throat> this looks like a fire. It was actually an explosion because salt water um, attacked an energized piece of equipment. And uh, you can see the devastation as a result of, of that. So our immediate response, and we're really good at emergencies, right? We damn the torpedoes, and we go ahead and we get the lights back on. We're really good at that. We had to get better at uh, planning for the future, and that we also have done. So we, uh, right after we did the repairs for all the damaged equipment, got all the lights back on, um, the, uh, we did site surveys to find out what the damage was uh, by, uh, uh, by our engineers. And then we developed a storm hardening program, uh, presented it to the Public Service Commission. They agreed with it, and, um, and we're off, at, off to the races. So our objectives were mit mitigate, minimize and be able to recover quickly. That's the resiliency part of what uh, was discussed a little earlier. 
So as you can see, um, we, we wanted to make sure that we first prevented any damage, then we wanted to minimize if there was damage, and then we wanted to be able to get it back real quick. Essentially, that was our philosophy. So within uh, seven months, which is June 1st, that's the start of the hurricane season in 2013, uh, we were able to do enough work such that if we had an exactly the same storm, none of the same equipment would get wet. So that was in a, a, within seven months we were able to accomplish that. That wasn't enough. We knew we were going to get something worse than Sandy because that's just the way things, uh, things happen. But we were, we were prepared for Sandy too if it occurred. So our storm hardening work uh, between 2014 and 2016 uh, was significant. We hit higher walls, uh, additional pumps, uh, generators. We raised critical equipment, uh, which was a, a significant effort. Now the design standard, we couldn't agree on it between the Public Service Commission, New York City, Westchester County, we just couldn't agree on it. So we went ahead and devised our own design. And it, it turns out that, that that is the accepted practice right now. But we took the new FEMA uh, 100 year flood uh, levels and we added three feet to it. So in 2050, we're looking at 30, we, I had 31 inches, but uh, the earlier uh, presenter had 30 inches in 2050 as the worst case scenario that could occur. So we, we went to 36 inches going forward. And if we um, have an opportunity to go beyond that, so that's our minimum, we will do that. If economically it makes sense to put it, to raise something higher than, than uh, then the three feet, we will do that, uh, go, just to ensure the future. We also, um, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll really look at this standard um, within the next 20 years, just to, just to see whether or not we are, there's any additional scientific evidence that might show that maybe we should start looking at something uh, greater than uh, plus three. So this is just a, a schematic to show um, <clears throat> where some of our typical equipment was and where the, uh, the Sandy 14.06 feet um, was in the battery. Um, this is usually a reference point for most, most um, flood levels is, is the battery. Uh, as you can see, a lot of our equipment is just under that. And now um, we're at, uh, at this particular place, we're at 19.77 uh, feet. And that was just the way that we went ahead and, and uh, raised the equipment. Just an illustration, uh, a general illustration of, of where we are in terms of our protection at uh, 13th Street, our East River uh, complex, which is where we generate steam and, and electricity. And, <clears throat> excuse me, this is a, a picture of the East River station. As you can see, it's surrounded by water. Um, we were inundated with water uh, at this particular facility, um, and it caused part of the um, loss of of electricity for the customers and for the steam for our steam customers also. So we went with a defense in depth approach, and that is first line of defense, second line of defense, third line of defense. So the first line of defense was essentially um, to cordon off with um, floodgates, flood walls, sealant. Um, so that's our first level of defense. Keep the water out. Flood level plus three. Uh, second level is to take the critical equipment and do the same thing with that. And that is to isolate it so that uh, if it does come over, uh, the, the, the other walls are breached, we still have our uh, typical equipment is um, protected. We put pumps in, that, in those areas so we, if, even if it leaks, we can pump it out. And the, uh, the uh, uh, third level I'm sorry, that was the, that was the uh, third level. The, sec the second level is putting high, high efficiency pumps within, um, within this structure so that if it does breach, we pump the water out. If it's still a breaches, we're protected here. And if the water does get in here, we pump it out. So it's kind of a three level defense in depth, uh, ensuring that we uh, protect the, uh, the equipment. So this is just a visual uh, illustration, um, level one protection. These are just some of the walls that we put up. 
These are high capacity pumps that were installed to ensure that the water, uh, if it does get in, we pump it out. Then uh, interior within a piece of, uh, particular piece of equipment, that's a transformer. We have a flood wall and then a flood, flood gate. We've raised the, uh, the critical equipment uh, to above flood, flood levels. And then this is a sealant. Some of the water got into um, our, our stations because they came in through pipe penetrations that were not sealed. So we went ahead and did a survey and sealed all of the pipe penetrations. Um, and then <clears throat> last case, worst case, is deployable measures. That means if, if for some reason um, we need a piece of equipment is, is threatened that we haven't anticipated because, as you know, flood levels are not the same throughout. Depends on hills and, and uh, depends which way the water is coming. You know, is it coming down through the, uh, the Long Island Sound? Is it coming up from the Jersey Shore? There's a lot of different um, scenarios, so the water could be in different places. Uh, these are only models. They're not necessarily absolutes. So we have a few um, deployable um, dikes, uh, some mobile diesel generators, and then shrink wrapping some equipment that uh, we just want to protect. We'll shut it down, we'll protect it. Water is gone, take the shrink rack off, and we can just start it right up again. So these are, uh, these are just some of the uh, um, pictures that show some of the walls and, and the work that had to be done Right here on the water, we had to put in um, sheathing and then pour concrete. It was, a, it was an engineering and construction um, a nightmare in, in a lot of cases because they weren't built for accessibility, especially from the water. Just some more uh, dikes and just to show you that, I mean, we put miles and miles and miles of sheet pile in just to protect the equipment. Uh, this is a, we raised uh, some, some of our, um, our equipment, another platform. These are um, <clears throat> down in lower Manhattan, some significant um, barriers had to be put up around openings um, that um, intruded on the sidewalk, but you know, we had to get approval for all of that. And just some more, some more barriers, interior walls. So in summary, you know, we pretty much touched uh, all of our, our equipment in, uh, that was in the flood zone or potentially in the flood zone. Um, our uh, protection is uh, FEMA 100 uh, plus three feet. And as you can see, um, concrete walls are over 11,000 uh, feet, 6,500 of sheet pile uh, walls, flood barriers, so you, so you can read it. So we had a significant in, um, um, investment of the ratepayer money into the infrastructure. Um, over the four year period. That's all I have. Thank you, Mark. I don't know about you, but I'm finding these presentations to be frightening and reassuring at the same time. I don't know if that's possible, but that was very interesting. Thank you. So we're gonna shift gears here a little bit and we're very happy to have Mike Fedison from Hilltop Hanover Farm here. Um, agriculture is one of the sectors that is most being impacted by climate change. Um, so it'll be nice to have this perspective. And Hilltop Hanover is actually a member of Westchester Green Business as well, and they have been for, for quite a while. So Mike Fedison is the Hilltop Hanover Farm Advisor. He's been farming, gardening, and teaching about agriculture since he was bitten by the plant bug in 2001. Um, previously, he was the farm manager at Purdy's Farmer and the Fish, which is a great restaurant if you haven't been. Um, it's in a unique farm-to-table restaurant in northern Westchester. Mike has also taught numerous classes right here at Westchester Community College um, as an adjunct for their certification program in sustainable vegetable production at Hilltop Hanover Farm. He's taken a year off from farming to stay at home with a new baby, but he can still be found gardening, consulting farmers about their soils, and teaching people how to make sauerkraut in his spare time. So welcome, Mike. slide I'm not that good at PowerPoint so um, thank you Scott and everyone um, so I'm, my, I'm actually gonna be frightening and then hopefully a little bit optimistic at the end also to continue the theme um, 
It's actually really interesting to hear what Anjali and Mark were saying. I thought I, my wife and I almost bought a house on the Croton River this summer, and then we learned about flood insurance. Um, we, we actually found that someone at FEMA that told me um, that to kind of budget in from the, the $2,000 flood insurance to budget in a 10% increase per year. So people can do that math on their phones to see what that might look like at the end of our mortgage. So we decided not to buy the house. Um, and I don't, I feel bad kind of for the person that did buy it. Eventually someone's going to have trouble selling that house and all those houses that we saw on the, the maps, which is pretty frightening. Um, so scientists are pretty uniform in thinking that things are going to get pretty crazy and in ways that we kind of don't really know yet. Um, predictions, we're kind of lucky in the Northeast here as far as um, precipitation. It's going to continue to rain, which is good, um, but the rain's going to be more heavy deluges and then more drought. So we're going to have more flooding, more drought, and less of the sort of nice gentle summer rains that um, my vegetables tend to prefer. So it's going to make farming a bit harder. Um, you know, everyone's heard about the earlier spring bloom times and confused insects. Um, uh, anyone, uh, probably people heard in the f uh, on the radio or in the news this fall. This was the first fall that I actually heard about um, reports of scientists talking about aberrant fall weather being associated with climate change as well. So we're seeing it all year round. Um, Farm animals are going to be under a lot more stress from heat, um, so there's going to be a lot higher mortality of uh, animals in the field. I'm going to need to do more things to take care of them on those increasing number of days over 95 degrees, um, as well as the humans out in the field. Um, after the military, farm workers have the highest uh, mortality rate of um, compared to other industries. Um, most vegetable pickers that are out there harvesting tomatoes and whatnot are paid by the pound and they're not paid very much. So there's not a lot of incentive to come in out of the shade and, and lose out on their paycheck. Um, uh, there's a story I just heard last week, or a week before last in the news about um, kind of contravening an interest little bit of conventional wisdom that um, the, um, and it's, there's so a lot of plant growers think it, it's, there's like, there might be kind of a little, a neat aspect to there being increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere because plants are gonna grow quicker. Um, but it turns out that those plants that are growing under higher carbon dioxide regimens have less nutrients in them. Um, and this is, this is something that is kind of, so this is something that, um, you know, hydroponic greenhouse growers have been taking advantage of for a while where they'll artificially enhance the atmosphere in the greenhouse so they can harvest lettuce a few days earlier and have more cycles of product coming through the greenhouses. But um, um, a lot of savvy farmers have act that have are kind of going back to growing heirloom vegetables. One of the reasons is that compared to modern hybrids, that plants are basically taking up water quicker, but the nutrients are going in at the same slow rate. So if you're harvesting something that's bred to gr size up quicker, you're just getting more water weight. You're not getting more of uh, you know calcium, magnesium, all the things that were actually. Uh, being, you know, doing our job and eating our vegetables for. Um, so um, that's kind of interesting. Um, and so one thing to remember, I think, is important when you hear about all these predictions is that um, they tend to get worse over time. So whatever the predictions are in 2017, the predictions in 2020, the numbers will be different. Um, since I, I um, went to college in the 90s, I studied geology and um, Part of the reason I got into farming was because I was I was going to go back to grad school and study quaternary geology, which um, any I actually saw a couple of people nod their heads. I mean, any <laughs> geology nerds in the audience know that that's basically the study from since the last ice age, the last two million years, which now has morphed into basically the study of, of climate change. So these are the you know the people that go out to the glaciers and pull up the cores of ice and then they analyze the little bits of carbon dioxide trapped in the ice so they can figure out what's, you know, what went on in the past to help give us clues about what's going on now. But, um, so, you know, so in the, you know, early 2000s, you were seeing like maybe one degree by 2050 and then a year or two later, maybe one degree by 2035 and then maybe two degrees by 2050 and then two degrees by 2035. Um, so, but I, th I think temperature is, is kind of a hard rubric to under. So I think sea level rise is really visceral. So 
um, all of my research is you know right in line with what everybody else is saying um, so that if we kind of everyone walks home today you know we leave our keys in the car we have some kind of societal epiphany we stop carbon pollution today in 2100 because of pollution we've already admitted that looks like three feet of sea level rise is what where they and these are talking about kind of like arcs of probability um, not you know and then the sort of business as usual path of slowly converting from shutting down a coal plant here starting a natural gas facility there installing more solar but kind of not really fundamentally altering the you know the the fact that we're kind of externalizing the cost of carbon pollution um, that's looking like six to eight feet in the year 2100. Um, my wife rides the metro north hudson line to work i don't know how that's going to go um, so where am i yeah so i mean yeah so it seemed like as an undergraduate in the 90s the writing on the wall is that even then was this is pretty serious and um, kind of analyzing this train wreck in further detail. I didn't, it seemed like um, I wanted to, I kind of wanted to think about solutions more. So we're going to talk about that in the, the positive side of the talk in a minute. Um, so, you know, now it's coming out like with the tobacco industry lawsuits. There's um, New York State is suing Exxon because of trying to find out what they knew two generations ago about climate change. Um, but ag so in addition to energy production, agriculture is one of the biggest drivers of climate change. Um, um, a lot, depending on where you're reading, you might see 30% or 40% of greenhouse pollution is from agriculture. Um, when you think about what industrial agriculture does, basically it eats e whole ecosystems. There is a prairie or a forest. Now it's a cornfield or a soybean field or there's a million cattle. Um, but it's not actually usually the diesel, you know, everyone's seen those pictures of the giant combines, you know, there's, and it's not actually necessarily the diesel that they're burning to drive around or the food miles that we hear a lot about. A lot of it has to do with the way that we're farming. By plowing up the soil every year, we're, ex, um, we're, we're also destroying the ecosystem in the soil, um, which we're gonna get to learn about a little bit more in a second. Um, so, plow, so turning this um, it, soil inside out um, a lot of this carbon that is stored in the soil as organic matter, I don't know if anyone is a gardener, um, you do your soil test every year, you see your percentage of organic matter, and your gold star is whether or not you've increased. If that goes up every year, that means you did a good job. If it, if it goes down, that means you should probably do something different next year. Um, so plowing up this organic matter every year causes a lot of it to oxidize, and so this carbon underground now goes back to the atmosphere as carbon gas, carbon dioxide is a gas. Um, um, and then we, of course we have the, the methane from the cows. This is, I wasn't gonna spend a lot of time on this, but just to kind of, it's really hard I think to, for myself to wrap my mind around humanity's impact on the planet. Um, so can everybody, I don't know, if, can, is this too light to read? Um, okay, so you can kind of see like where, like where I'm thinking about you know, where the herd, you think about the, you know, National Geographic pictures of all the wildebeest and zebras and the Serengeti and the elephants, you know. Um, so there's a lot of cows out there. Um, so locally, to kind of bring, come back to Westchester, farmers are struggling. Um, this is just true. Um, Cost of land has more to do with development value than agricultural productivity. So think about how many houses can we put here or what's the view like, not how good is the soil, how many people can this land feed over time sustainably. Um, so we continue to pave over farmland. So this sort of calculus of cost of land, vagaries of food production now, I mean, there's with more drought, more flooding, um, it's not really certain what's you know, how to, how to manage that. A lot of small farmers around here basically use diversity as their, um, for their survival. They grow 50 or 100 different varieties of things so that, same, you know, same with the mutual fund. You have, it's gonna be, it might not be a great year for melons, but you'll have a good tomato year or good for sugar snap peas or something so that you have, you have the bumper crop of something and maybe something else doesn't do so well. Um, you know, lots of things, uh, so it's increasingly harder for farmers to stay in business. 
Um, so I've been farming in Westchester for about seven years, the last seven years, and every year I see farmers leaving. Um, lots of things affect the price of food. Um, there's definitely, there's a direct correlation between um, using fewer toxic chemicals and the cost of labor. Um, you, you basically, you, you get what you pay for. Um, Raising Elijah is a really good book I read recently um, that if you want to learn more about um, uh, the toxicity of common chemicals used on farms. Um, another book if you want to learn more about farm, um, it's called Tomato Land, which talks about um, actual slaves being rescued in Florida in the tomato fields down there. Um, so as I said, I was going to get to some positive. So now we have the, we're going to swing up a little bit. Um, so does everyone remember photosynthesis? Yes. Right? So we have sunlight. What else do we have? Carbon dioxide. And then what's the other? And you remember the other ingredient? Water. So sunlight, carbon dioxide, water. Plants have this magic ability to make oxygen, which is great for us. Um, but also they make sugar. Um, the chemical formula, of the, the sugar that they make, um, the first one is glucose, which is C6H12O6. Um, so this carbon pollution in the atmosphere actually has a pathway down into the soil. So has anyone ever tried to live on just sugar? And you've just <laughs> eaten too many Twizzlers or Skittles or something? So it's just actually the same thing for plants. This kind of blew my mind when I first started learning about this, that plants, all the sugar that the plants make during photosynthesis, they don't just eat. They actually share at least half of it with it leaks out of their root system to feed the microbiology in the soil, all the symbiotic bacteria, fungi, etc. And all those creatures, everybody remember the periodic table from science class way, way long ago? Plants need about half of those elements on the periodic table in order to grow. And most of those come through their symbiotic interactions with the biology in the soil. So, so this carbon so does everyone see where I'm going here? So there's a way to get carbon from the atmosphere and put it back underground. And this is the only, this is the only thing in my, re this thing that makes a lot of sense to me. Because there's so many cascading benefits from increasing the organic matter in your soil. It um, improves the resistance to flooding that makes the soil basically spongier. So you can absorb those heavier impacts of all these flooding rains. Um, there's correlations to disease resistance, plant health, nutrient density, all, and it all, it's all connected with pulling carbon dioxide out of the air. And I think this is something that we should talk about more. Um, so we, it's, I think it's important to support farmers that are doing this, which is not always apparent who's doing this, right? So I think it's important for people to go talk to, find a farmer, talk to them, ask them what are they doing? Are they, are they increasing their organic matter? You can ask them. That's kind of the point of a lot of these direct marketing methods that farmers are using now is you can actually talk to them and ask them questions. You can ask them what chemicals are they using? What are they doing about their organic matter? Are they tilling? Are they no-tilling? Are they mulching? And we should keep those people in business because those people are doing something really important for society. Um, there's uh, so, so ways to learn more about this. Um, the Bionutrient Food Association is a local farming and gardening organization. Um, they have meetings potlucks and uh, every month. Uh, the Westchester Growers Alliance is an organization of local farmers. Um, can connect with them. Um, Hilltop Hanover, just this past year, um, they're working with Westchester County um, on this cool project to start a Westchester County farm trail where um, farm, all the farms that are open to the public are now linked and there's a lot of informa more information out there for people to, to visit their local farms and meet their farmers and pester them about their organic matter. Thanks, Mike. Also, what you were saying about the impact of um, climate change on the workers had me thinking, I'm, I'm originally from Northern California, about the recent forest fires and how so many of the agricultural workers out there are now forced to, to leave because a lot of their places of employment are now um, no longer. So it's a really, really current and relevant topic. Thank you. So our next speaker is Josh Woodbury from Swiss Re, um, a local Westchester-based company. Josh is currently a flood specialist in the Natural Catastrophe Modeling Team at Swiss Re. 
He has been involved in model and product development for Flood in the U.S. and Canada. He joined the company in 2013. Prior to Swiss Re, Josh completed his master's and PhD at Cornell University in water resource systems engineering. Before entering Cornell, Josh completed a bachelor's degree in civil and environmental engineering at Clarkson University. Welcome, Josh. So I created this presentation and I think I had three or four slides and I really thought I'd win the least slide contest, but <laughs> one slide's tough to beat. Um, yeah, so I really thought about what you know, I should present and we can talk, you know, we can ask questions, how Swiss Re approaches this uh, climate change, business, all that stuff, right? It, you know, reinsurance is our business, catastrophes are, is Swiss Re's business. Um, and of course, this will ch uh, climate change will impact us, and we can discuss this more, but I think uh, what I studied as a grad student was this very sort of water resource systems. And I think I really developed this approach or this type of thinking where you really think of things as a system. And as I moved into Swiss Re, and I kind of saw the underwriting process, the model process, what we're actually doing, I was like, oh, this is very much systems thinking. And I've given sort of similar presentations, and I think this systems approach or systems thinking can really help everyone, from a local business person to a community level. Uh, and I just thought I'd sort of formalize, and I know, you know, if you really think about it, everyone probably knows this. Uh, but this is a, maybe a more formal way of thinking about it, uh, and I think it helps quite a bit. Uh, so, yeah, so I'll talk a bit about that. Uh, and I think, since I live in the big corporate world these days, uh, the presentation does not necessarily reflect the views of Swiss Re. Okay, I have to say that. Um, Right, so I really try to think of an example, an easy example to do this. Uh, and if you start taking this, this example to sort of your personal level and thinking, okay, what is my system I'm, I'm worried about? I think this is quite transferable and it's kind of easy to, to use. Uh, and so I think as an example, think you're an urban planner. And I realized as I was doing this, I hope urban planners do this. Uh, but you've been tasked with designing an evacuation route for severe hurricanes, right? So this is quite timely. Uh, we've had several hurricanes that have been pretty devastating. Uh, and a big part of you know, safety is getting people out. Um, so you've decided on the following route, uh, but you've been asked to estimate the resiliency, right? Uh, and I think part of, part of this, I have some numbers in here. Uh, and I saw earlier Angeli, Angeli uh, she defined risk in a certain way. And so when we look at risk as underwriters, insurance companies, uh, we think of it as the probability that something occurs times the severity, right? We're really thinking about the worst case scenario uh, and basically what's it gonna cost us. So if you, think of, uh, if you think of this route as kind of a system, right? So people start at home, they have to take road A, take road B, road C, uh, and then they get to safety, right? So I wanna know the probability of failure or resiliency or the reliability of this system. So when I think of system, right, so I can say well, road A is a component, road B is a component, and road C is a component, right? So I'm really trying to understand <clears throat> if this fails, how does it fail, <clears throat> and what component fails, right? Just a little quicker. Right, so <clears throat> back to my original question, <clears throat> excuse me, what's the reliability of this system? Well, I say, okay, well, I need to know the reliability of each component. Uh, and I send out some smart engineers, scientists, uh, consultants, and they come back and they tell me, well, road A is, road a is pretty good, right? I built it uh, last year, it's basically indestructible, very good road, no problems. Road B, uh, maybe I built it a few years ago, uh, it was really good at that time, but it's a bit old, right? Maintenance is a problem, so it's a little bit lower in reliability. And I go to road C and say, okay, well, that's, that's a tough one, right? 60% reliability, it fails. Uh, maybe you drive through a swamp or sort of a marshy area, it floods quite regularly. Uh, and so really your system depends on the reliability of road C in this case. So this is kind of a series system. So there's two sort of basic 
systems, right? So you think of a series, things go in, you know, from one to the next. Uh, and the second is kind of, I'll introduce as a parallel, right? So you have some bit of redundancy. But in this case, uh, the reliability of the system, assuming they're all independent, is 56%. So if I'm telling my constituents that they need to take this route to get to safety, it's not a very good idea, right? It's kind of low reliability, it's not very good. So if I view this from a systems perspective, I'm really saying, uh, okay, uh, each component, I know each component, so I know what the system, how the system acts. Right? So then I say, okay, well, maybe I'm given a bit of money and I can improve road B, for example. Right? So I can make that much better. I bump that up to 99%, uh, similar to road A, but I still have this drag road C. Right? So still, it doesn't change much. Right? So what I'm trying to present right, is you look at this as a system, there are different components. Can I improve different components and what happens? So next I go, okay, well, uh, maybe I pay a contractor a little bit more, get a better one. He tells me to improve or she tells me to improve uh, road C. Right? So I still have this kind of series system. I've really bumped up the reliability now. So it's really, so you can think of this as in your business, right? What's your sort of product chain? What are the ins? What are the outs? What components, what systems do I rely on? And which one is the weakest? And if it's the weakest and then I can improve it, you know, it's, it's economically viable, it doesn't cost much, I should always improve the weakest, right? Sort of the weakest chain, weakest link is your, your chain, right? So finally, uh, the second part or important basic concept of systems thinking uh, is parallel systems. And so in this case, I say, okay, well, instead of just having a road A, B, and C, that's the way I go, maybe I find a road D uh, that's equally probably not as good as, you know, similar in terms of reliability of road C, but at least it's a second route. So now what has to happen uh, for the system to fail would be either, you know, road C and D would have to fail in this case if I'm at that segment. So now I say, okay, well, what's the reliability of this system? So now it's about 80%. So just simply saying, uh, for example, if I can't improve road C, I don't have the funds, I can't do it, maybe I can just think about an alternative route for road C. So this is really basic, uh, and I, I think it speaks very much to sort of these ideas of vulnerability, right? Um, what we talked about earlier with Mark is saying, you know, maybe these components that are next to the water are the most vulnerable. I need to fix those. So you could think of that as kind of road C. So if you think about this and break down sort of any system you're thinking about, uh, I think it can go a long ways in improving sort of resiliency. And so if I think this, think about this in the context of climate change, <clears throat> I might say, okay, well, I know, <clears throat> for example, road C is flooded a lot. Maybe it'll flood even more. So I really need to focus on that component under climate change, right? So what part of your system is particularly susceptible to the impacts of climate change? Yeah, and you know, there's a lot of uncertainty about what that means, right? We generally know the temperature go up, maybe it'll rain more because the atmosphere can hold more water when it's warmer, uh, but there's sort of tertiary impacts or some secondary impacts that we don't really know. But you might be able to think about them in the context of your system and say, you know, maybe if I have a business and I'm near the water, you know, my business inside everything is extremely resilient, it's no problem, but the road that takes people from where they live to my business floods a lot, right, then how does that impact your business? Maybe in that case you need to move. You have to think maybe a five or ten year uh, plan to move your business. So if I bring this back to kind of Swiss Re and what we think about and in the business of risk, it's very much this, right? So in this case we look at the risk as the probability that something happens uh, times the severity, right? Like, you know, it, it's a, a low probability event, but it's extremely costly there's still a relatively fair risk there. And so when we think about underwriting, we took a particular location, say, okay, if maybe it's a train station, what can go wrong? How can it go wrong? Uh, what's the weakest link sort of in that system? Um, and what might it cost me? So that's kind of it for me. Um, I think this is a really interesting concept. There's, there's tons of additional complexities, right? What happens if say the probability of road C and D are dependent, right? They're not independent components. Uh, maybe there's some feedback loops in your system. Uh, how does that play out? Uh, it gets to people that are probably much smarter than I am with maths and all this. Um, but this concept is here and I think it's quite valuable. Yeah, that's it.
Thanks, Josh. It's not our focus today, but um, in terms of internal operations, now Swiss Re is a great corporate citizen here in Westchester, and they installed recently one of the largest, I think, solar installations in the state um, for a commercial business. So um, they're doing a lot also locally to be a green, a green, a green business. So we're happy to hear that. Um, so I think what I want to do now is just open it up to questions that there might be in the audience to any of the, the four panelists that we've heard from today. Um, we have a mic here if anyone wants to ask a question. And I believe now they have mics as well to answer. Um, so we'd love to hear from anyone if you have a question now. I'm going to try and. Just one second, let's get the mic to you real quick. Thank you. I'm an architect, but the, um, I'm an avid reader of the Financial Times. And uh, last year, uh, there were several articles by um, scientists away from our continent. And their numbers on the flood levels were, I would say, on a different category that we see in our graphs. And of course, just the fact that how Antarctica and Iceland are melting in a unexpectedly fast pace that we have no idea what is going on, but we know that they're going to be, it's going to be a lot of water. And how does that reflect to, for instance, the Con Ed and the power, I mean, impacts, I mean, if they are right, we're going to be in a very serious situation around here. So my response to that is, um, we've all watched the hurricane tracks and you see the spaghetti, and there's always an outlier, and rarely does the common understanding of where this hurricane's gonna go follows that outlier. We did a, an extensive amount of research when we decided on where we wanted to be in 2030. Um, and the consensus was most of the spaghetti was around 31, 33 feet, uh, uh, inches, uh, 36 inches. Um, there were outliers, um, and, and we decided that we would um, go with the, the um, common understanding of where it would be in 2030. Uh, we also committed to keep looking at it as more and more scientific data comes in. So that's really our, our answer. We, Nobody knows what 2050 is going to like, look like, 20, you know, 2100 is going to look like. I hope to still be here, but that's another story. Um, so I think that that's, you know, that's our approach, is that you know, we're not discounting it, but we have to make a judgment call based on what the common understanding is. Does that answer your question? OK. I think also, typically, people, um, they use scenarios to address these issues. <coughs> and, excuse me, um, depending on the project, you know, if it's critical infrastructure versus a residential home, they're going to have different um, types of risks that they're going to have to identify and, you know, plan for. So these scenarios, depending on, for example, some of these biggest unknowns are with the rate of ice melting. And that's why they develop a range, right? So, but it is important, so it may be more important for critical infrastructure to consider these tail ends that are mm -hmm. higher, or sort of lower probability, higher impact um, than for right. you know, a little bungalow on, on mm -hmm. the sea. That's a really good point. Yeah. What? Anne? Uh, thank you very, very, very much. Wonderful and important um, panel discussion. Um, I'm Ann Jaffe Holmes, Greenberg Nature Center, and um, lots of questions, but I'll start with just a question for, uh, for Anjali. Um, what um, uh, infrastructure elements has the county identified at this point uh, that are uh, at most risk uh, with the sea level rise? Great question. We have identified uh, pump stations, sewage treatment plants, roads, buildings, um, you name it. Take your kids to Playland now. <laughs> so, yeah, there, there, there's variabil variability. Um, 
you know, depending on the floodplains and the time period you're looking at. But all of these things will be affected. So Angelie's study looked at Westchester County owned assets. Is that correct? So we weren't looking at we looked at I, I looked items at like Indian Point Westchester and County owned assets as well as environmental risks, hazardous treatment facilities, um, you know, different uh, sources of environmental hazard pollution, um, and and we're getting into businesses now. If I could add. Um, yeah. We work with the county and or the municipalities to identify those critical resources. And while I didn't talk about the overhead uh, resiliency that we uh, have installed, a significant amount of what we did was associated with overhead. Um, so with those critical infrastructure um, that are, are identified by the municipalities, including the county and the state, uh, we harden those um, electrical supplies to the pumping stations. They are on a particular uh, list that we have that we monitor. Um, during a storm, we make sure that, uh, that we understand uh, the, whether or not that station is out. We respond accordingly. Uh, so there's a partnership there with, with knowing where the critical infrastructure is and our storm hardening efforts that we've uh, done over the last four years. Hmm. Thank you all for your great presentations. It seems like in the not too distant future, many of us are, that don't need it now are gonna need flood insurance, you know, for our homes, for our businesses. And it seems like the cost is going to be prohibitive. You know, it, I, I have heard about that 10% increase per year, but it also seems like there's no way around it. I was just wondering if you have anything to say about that. Josh. Uh, yeah, I have a lot. But um, yeah, I think the, the, so you can either look at it from right the NFIP, which is uh, the sort of the government run approach. Uh, but I think also you're seeing many more private insurers trying to get into the space. And I think in a lot of ways, the, yeah, a bit of a plug, but uh, the private side can do it better, uh, maybe cheaper, better sort of terms, conditions. I think they probably have a better view of the real, the true risk. Um, the sort of the, the FEMA system is really good. Uh, I think there are some areas they can improve in terms of the granularity of the view of the risk because this kind of in or out is really not natural. So the real difference between someone that's like sort of on the edge inside the flood, the, the, the A zone and someone that out, that's outside, just outside, is, should not be that much different. Uh, it's this artificial decrease um, that I think you'll see more private insurers get into and then they'll maybe show the the, the, the true view of risk. Um, but I think there are certain locations, right, that uh, are in really high risk zones that probably the private industry can't do now and probably won't be able to do for a long time. Uh, and I think in that case, it has to be some something else. Uh, and what that is, I think uh, they'll have to start figuring out because exactly, you know, it's it's, it's much more political than just the flood zone and the science and what goes on there, right? So uh, the real estate industry <laughs> makes a lot of noise when you try to change uh, flood zones. Um, people trying their hats on their house, right? Like this, right. this example that was given earlier, if you try to sell that house later on, people will have to start thinking about the true value. Um, so I think there's a lot of changes. Hopefully those changes move in the positive direction. But I think you can, if you see more private sort of uh, entrance into the space, you can hopefully will at least also force for, uh, FEMA to get a truer view of the risk. And isn't it similar to health insurance that if more people are forced to get into the market that and the risk is spread out over more you know population centers since there's more flooding for almost everyone, would prices also potentially go down just because more people are going to need to have the insurance or? Yeah, uh, so that's kind of insurance 101, right? So right. you're spreading the risk essentially. But it's a good point. I mean, it's it's kind of lost, I think, in a lot of these conversations. Um, but you can look at other, uh, you know, other countries. France is an example where it's just compulsory. Uh, you just buy flood insurance with your home, hmm. whether you're in the risk or not. Uh, I've heard some arguments about that, right? That you know, this is America. We don't force people to do things like that. Um, but uh, whether you believe that or not. Uh, I think there's different ways to do flood insurance in different markets in different countries. Canada is an interesting example because they've just recently 
have initiated kind of a homeowner's coverage, but it's entirely private. Uh, but they sort of have, for high-risk areas, there's a private-public partnership. Um, so there are models out there that are probably better than what we have, mm -hmm. and we could adjust and improve a bit. Yeah. I, ju I just wanted a quick follow-up um, uh, on uh, the county. Um, on the infrastructure elements that are being identified, does the county, has the county established a mechanism or a plan for following up on that and working with the municipalities that are involved or the locations or, or the counties or any, anybody to, uh, to deal with the situations? We're trying. We're, <coughs> excuse me. We're trying to start to develop some of these conversations across stakeholders, basically, and uh, hoping for something in the spring. Yeah. Um, Ellen Thigg from Groundwork Hudson Valley. Uh, this is for Mark Drexel. Um, have you hardened the electric assets in Westchester County as well? I mean, your presentation was on the city, and is there a report on that available to the public? Um, so yes, we have hardened. Uh, as part of the billion dollars, there was a significant amount that was um, um, dedicated towards um, putting in uh, additional um, circuits so that if any one circuit was um, damaged, we'd limit it uh, to uh, 500 people being affected, uh, whereas before you could have thousands of people. So that was all completed. Uh, we uh, are installing, have installed and, and continue to install uh, breakaway services so if you've ever had your uh, service um, knocked down by a tree, what usually happens is it pulls away from your house, and now you have to get an electrician to put that back up before we can put the power back. Um, so now we have these breakaways so that they, they actually break away from the pole. The wire lays on the floor. There's no electricity coming from Con Edison, so they're safe. Um, and then we just need a ladder to put them up, and there's no damage to the house. Um, so we've put in um, isolation switches um, for all of the loops. Uh, most of our, our, uh, our infrastructure in the overhead is, is loops, so that if you, if you, you can isolate any one fault uh, within, within the loop. Uh, so there was a significant amount of, of effort that was done. That's a whole other presentation. Mm -hmm. um, so I focused on, on, the, on the climate change in terms of the, the sea level rise for our presentation. But uh, yeah, I have given several. There, is our, there are four or five uh, reports that we had to file with the Public Service Commission based on how we spent the money over the last four years. Um, they're on the Public Service web website, um, so you can read them. And, and uh, details, you might even see some of these pictures in there. This is uh, Mick Gilbert from Con Edison. I, w I want to ask my colleague Mark a question. So, in our energy, not to put you on a spot. So in our energy efficiency programs, we're putting a lot, we're, we're encouraging a lot of backup generation going in through our demand management and demand response programs. Uh, particularly, we're seeing a lot of this in Westchester. I was just curious, you kind of touched on the, and most of these are gas for logistical and environmental reasons and permitting reasons. You kind of touched on the resiliency of the gas system during storm events. I wonder if you can go deeper into that, because what I noticed in that our own facilities it appeared that your pumps and generators were all diesel. Uh, I think that they're not all diesel. We have connected to the gas system. Okay. Um, again, there was significant um, work done during the last four years to harden the gas system. We have a lot of tunnels. We have uh, gate stations uh, that also needed to be uh, hardened. Um, we had control uh, um, uh, instrumentation that needed to be uh, raised above the flood level. So there's a significant amount of work that we did there also. Uh, again, I'll refer to you to those same reports. They're probably on our int internet site too, if, you, if you'd like to, to read them. Um, so the gas system is in interesting because it, it is the part of our business that's growing dramatically because of some of the regulations of uh, uh, the furnaces uh, getting off uh, uh, fossil fuels, uh, backup generators, uh, so it was significant. We're doing a lot of uh, main reinforcement and uh, increasing the size of, of uh, the uh, pipes in the ground. So if you see some digging going on, um, 
That's usually what it is. It's, it's reinforcing it. It's not necessarily fixing it. Uh, we're put, just putting in bigger pipes. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> Hi, Mark. This is uh, Ryan over here. Um, this is probably a follow-up, close follow-up to the last two questions. Um, it just, again, from your presentation, it seemed like there was a lot of damage from, on the electric side. And with the trend on, on the electric side, whether it's you know, vehicles and communications and um, you know, solar charging, batteries, where do you see you know, resiliency in light of so much greater dependence on, the, on EV and, and electric in general? So the way I can answer that is that the, the, uh, the initiative within New York State, the, the Revin initiative, um, is highlighting distributed generation. So there's, there's the um, no longer the central out distribution systems. Um, those are much more reliable just by the fact that they're distributed um, and that a single point of failure is unlikely for those. So I see the whole rev as improving the uh, resiliency of the electric system. Um, and I think that as time goes on, you'll see more and more um, distributed en uh, energy uh, generation uh, for communities, for municipalities that will be um, standalone uh, islands, um, which are, are very reliable assuming the maintenance is ma maintained. By distributed energy, are you referring to microgrids and that sort of thing? Microgrids is a, is a the form of that. Form of that, yes. Okay. Right. Thank you. You have a question? Yeah. My question is for Mike, uh, but obviously anybody can uh, speak to it. I'm Ali from We Cultivate New York. I'm focused and my company is focused on the land restoration for New York State for farms and brownfields. And so, you know, when you talk about, you know, we need to pull these nutrients out of the air and put them back into the ground. I understand you, but maybe you can expound on you know the different methods uh, that we can implement to really help the soil of New York State. So the the USDA has been testing. Um, I'm, I'm a vegetable farmer, so that's what I know more about um, the nutrients in vegetables for 50, 60 years now. And what they have been finding basically is that it's a downward curve. That our broccoli has less calcium in it than it does several generations ago. Um, primary reason for that is if farming kind of um, occurs as more of an extractive industry, if you're taking calcium out by harvesting the broccoli and you're not putting it back in, then eventually you have less and less calcium every year, right? So this is why. Um, you know, compost is such an important thing, but there's um, there's also minerals that are not in compost. That um, you know, when we think about how cycles work in ecosystems and nature, basically, soil is part like a big portion of soil is bedrock. The min and so it's the minerals that are in the rocks that are broken down, um, smaller and smaller pieces, so that in the feldspars, all of the you know, the silicates and the sulfur, all the, the silica then becomes available to the plant over, over many, many generations of cycling through different microbes. But not the bedrock everywhere around is not equivalent, doesn't have the same minerals in it. So this is why you see some places are better for farming, other places are less good for farming. So every farm I've ever worked on, we've had to supplement with other minerals. And probably a lot of people know about adding limestone to add calcium, but there's, you know, we mentioned that Plants need about half of those elements from the periodic table in order to grow. The ones that are coming from the atmosphere are, you know, there's carbon, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, and that's about it, right? The water is coming from below. So everything else is coming up from the soil. Does that answer? <coughs> Hi, um, I'm Hillary Baum from the New York State Sustainable Business Council. Thank you all for great uh, presentations and a terrific program. Um, I kind of have, uh, my question is kind of a follow-up question that was just asked, and it is also for Mike. Um, and that is, um, you know, you made it clear that 
at, that the right kind of agriculture is really a mitigation strategy for climate change or, and is becoming more and more recognized as such. So my question is, um, since this is, uh, you know, tied in with, of course, the mo you know, one of the most important things in the world, which is food production, um, how do we um, promote this idea more? How do we educate people about how important this kind of practice is uh, in terms of a mitigation strategy? That's a really good question. It actually reminded me of something I thought of belatedly for Ali's question. Um, the, one of the organizations that I mentioned, the Bionutrient Food Association, um, just this year is coming out with a prototype for a tool that actually it's a handheld device. You can bring it to the, the grocery store or the farmer's market and it operates with light. Um, it's a, essentially a spectrophotometer, which is kind of the same technology that astronomers use to look at a star and say this is 20% helium and 54% hydrogen, et cetera. But you can look at a vegetable now and say this vegetable has nutrients in it, this one's junk. And so you can see, you know, this one, this one may cost more, but then so there, I think we're very, close to having, being on the cusp of having a kind of a validation for the farmers that are doing the work to improve their soil um, that is separate from just the monetary, these tomatoes at Stop and Shop are 99 cents and the ones at the farmer's market are $5 a pound. 